today. Um, I'd like to start with just an introduction to my field, which is the uh, economics of public health and how come it's relevant. It's a pretty easy thing to do these days. Uh, I'd like to talk specifically about uh, the financial aspects of the public health practice units that everybody in the world wishes were functional and effective back in December in 2019. Uh, and then prospects for learning to do better the next time we have to face uh, one of these threats to public health. So that's just sort of a warming up introduction. What is public health economics and why does it matter? And then we're going to apply uh, public health economics to two specific questions, which are the economics of the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and then finally, the economics of the, the vulnerable groups that are affected by both COVID-19 and the social distancing measures that have destroyed their livelihoods. So that's what we'll be covering today. Uh, and I'd like to launch into my first Part, which is definitions of uh, economics and public health economics. Let me start with that. So economics is not the study of money, it's the study of choices. So what we work on is trying to examine how human beings make choices, especially when they don't know everything there is to know about the consequences of their choices. And so when we apply economics to health, uh, we're studying the economics of, of health choices and how people make decisions about their, their body's health and about the healthcare system when they, they don't know everything. So uh, when we think about uh, the area of the health choices that have to make, I think this typology can be helpful. A lot of us, myself included, trained in clinical medicine. Uh, I still practice emergency medicine once a week. And at that point, we're taking individuals who are already sick mostly, and we are doing things to help them not be sick anymore. So this is the, the most common uh, area of healthcare that, that is familiar to many of us. Um, in general practice, uh, we take individuals who are not sick and we uh, do things to prevent disease with them. We can go and, and do a physical exam or a, a checkup to uh, identify issues that could be done to prevent disease. And we would give vaccinations and behavioral change counseling to individuals. This is very uh, comfortable space for a lot of, of doctors, nurses, and pharmacists. Over here is doing prevention and cure for groups of tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions. Um, and public health is the art and the science of preventing diseases in large groups of people. Uh, it has its own 150-year history. It has uh, key sciences like epidemiology and public health communication, policy change, and that's what we're, we're doing over at the Bloomberg School every day. Um, and mostly we're trying to affect choices that prevent diseases in millions. There is a version of this uh, public health practice that is uh, uh, pertaining to delivering cures to people, making sure that they have healthcare coverage and high quality healthcare services so that when they do get sick, millions of them get care over time. This typology is helpful because today in this space, I'm going to mainly talk about public health economics and clinical preventive medicine economics when we come to talk about a vaccine. So uh, the, the thing to say about is that public health is really what we wish we had uh, in December of 2019. And the countries in the world that did a good job of public health uh, back in December and January are really enjoying uh, much, much better control of the epidemic than, than the countries that uh, did not execute public health effectively. Um, let me get the screen sharing back because I don't think you're seeing my slides anymore. Um, hold on. Okay. Nope, we're still not seeing the slides. You can, you can see them, David, they look great. You can see the slides? Okay, great. Um, great, so uh, let's talk about public health economics. Now, there are very few countries where we can draw maps like this. Uh, this is a map of the number of, uh, uh, of life years expected uh, down at the county level in America. Uh, what we see when we're able to draw maps like this, when we have level registration data down at this fine level, we can see hotspots of high mortality. And in the U.S., we've known this for years, there are pockets in the Mississippi Valley where life expectancy is in the, the 60s. 
uh, here in Appalachia, another pocket where life expectancy is in the 60s. Um, areas on Indian reservations where life expectancy is in the, the high 60s. And then long life places up in the 80s here along the California coast and in the cities. Uh, when we see maps like this, it's hard to say that this is all about individual choice. Uh, why is it that everybody in the Mississippi Valley uh, is making choices? Uh, things that we know is in this Mississippi Valley, uh, there are many uh, people vulnerable due to structural racism uh, and deprivation of the necessary inputs into a healthy life. And the same within the Native American reservations. So there are choices that affect the health of hundreds of thousands of people at a time and they are spatial and they affect people in space. So what governments have done for over 150 years is try to spend money on places to make them healthier. This is a tiny, tiny amount of the world's healthcare spending. Officially, the US spends $90 billion on public health. Of that 90 billion, 10 billion is spent by the CDC and 80 billion is both raised and spent by states and counties to run state and county health departments that try to take small places and make them healthier by doing infectious disease surveillance, uh, behavior change communication about tobacco and alcohol, uh, STD control, uh, whatever. They're supposed to practice rational policies to try to uh, address the, the concerns of every single state and county. So this $90 billion was the money that might have helped us be prepared for COVID-19. Unfortunately, like everywhere on earth, uh, the health departments were starved for cash. Their money was raided by uh, other interests by the government, um, reallocated to other, other programs. The people running health departments in the US as elsewhere on earth were distracted by donors in the US, it was CDC and HHS that said, here's some money to do this thing. And in global health, that's often a distraction where you're a health officer in a district in Africa or Asia and someone comes along and with a grant from uh, the World Bank and says, no, we want you to do this disease or that disease. So many of these health departments uh, didn't have their own cash to do effective practice and they were reallocated towards the disease of the day based on a donor's interest and they were not practicing public health. Here is a map of public health spending. Uh, and again, very few countries have data down at this fine level of the county. Uh, but you can see that in the same exact area uh, in the Mississippi Valley and out on Indian reservations, and in Appalachia over here, uh, public health spending was pink and, and orange, which is less than $25 per person per year. And in these plush areas on the California coast and in the cities, uh, public health spending was over $200 per capita. So we have uh, a small amount of money that can be spent to address public health problems. Um, it's not going to the places that need it. The USA, due to its governmental uh, constitution, doesn't have a way to, to, to raise money at the national level and reallocate it to the places that need it most. We've already established that we need to improve the public health in our structurally deprived areas where racism has been uh, a long-term determinant of health. But every county, every state has to raise their own money for public health and then try to do the right thing with it. And that's, that's always been a problem. I'm showing you the US because there are uh, deprived areas here. Um, we're able to do some of these maps in my work in, in Africa and Asia, but it's just so hard to collect data on public health spending because everybody who collects spending data is collecting clinical spending data. So um, the hypothesis I'm going to challenge today is that the, the the public health departments uh, that have been doing their job effectively in the past, uh, if you've been spending well and making good choices in the past, we should see that help counties bend the curve on COVID-19 faster. So we did a quick exercise where we're calculating the time from the 10th case to the, the bending of the curve. And we were able to do time to event to try to study systematically uh, what affected a county's uh, success at rapidly 
getting control of the coronavirus test. Now, a statistical analysis like this has to control for population density, poverty, the number of coronavirus tests per 100,000, and so we put that in. Uh, the thing we're, we're testing is the time going from, uh, on this axis, an incidence of 3.5 cases, bending the curve. We're asking how long did it take this county of Medina, Ohio, to bend its coronavirus uh, curve. So in a time to event analysis, we draw these survival plots. Here, 100% of counties in America have not bent their curve. And as the days go by, day 20, 100% have not bent their curve. Uh, 40 days go by, no one's bent their curve. And by about the 70th day um, uh, this year, some of the counties started achieving control of their coronavirus epidemic and reached their apex. What we found uh, in this analysis was that uh, if your spending was less than the 25th percentile of public health spending, it took you uh, longer to achieve control uh, of the virus in the rural areas uh, of the USA. However, in the cities, public health spending didn't seem to, to be very effective in getting you control. Now, we have been doing this analysis uh, again and again, controlling for other social demographic factors. And we know for now, preliminary result is that being in the top quartile of public health spending can shorten your time to control the, the epidemic by about 7%. But this is a, a figure that's changing every day. So good news and bad news, right? So public health spending can help some American counties a little bit, but in the, the, the cities doesn't seem to be uh, very effective. We're making sense of this and I'd like to sort of help us think together about uh, public health spending as the tool we wish we had and how to get more out of it. Uh, I'm disappointed that it, it doesn't seem to be that effective uh, in, our, in our cities. So going through thinking about this, um, I've seen for many years that public health departments around the globe uh, have budgets that make no sense. Uh, as I said earlier, they're starving for money. They have health commissioners that really don't know how to practice public health and can't make rational choices about priorities. So they often um, pass the plate to, to get money from whoever's got money to fund vertical programs to attack you know, malaria, obesity, whatever the money does, tells them to do is what they do. Um, thinking as clinicians, what would, wouldn't make sense for you as a clinician taking care of somebody with uh, uh, a headache to say, look, I know you have a headache, but I only have money today to talk about uh, your orthopedic health and I'm only gonna talk about whether your joints hurt because that's, where, that's who's paying me today uh, is the arthritis company. So I know you say you have a headache, but I'm gonna take care of your joint health. But this is what's happening inside public health departments. Counties and, and states are having public health problems, and yet the health, uh, public health money is tied to diseases that are not the top priority of that place. So I wanted to show you the reality of this here in the city of Baltimore. This is our current public health budget for the city of Baltimore, a city where our number one health problems are uh, related to, to racism and structural uh, racism in the past. We have homicide and violence. Uh, we have the uh, diseases of uh, mental health, uh, drug addiction. And so one would think that we would spend our money uh, on that, but instead uh, a third of the budget here in blue uh, is to, to cure people and give them HIV AIDS treatment. It's a great thing to do, a wonderful thing to do with the clinical money, but this is all the money we had to prevent disease, and now a third of it is gone for, for treatment. Uh, we have uh, about a, a fourth of the money being spent on maternal and child health. Uh, we have uh, school health. We're spending about uh, an eighth of our money on school nurses. But the, the part of this that should have been doing our health priorities is just not, not available. So less than half of our spending is, is, is for real public health that we really needed to, to, be, to be ready. So we have a problem of not enough money. And when we get money in public health, we reallocate it based on funding priorities. This is uh, an estimate of trends over time. The official estimate of public health spending, as I said, is that the total America spends $90 billion on public health. 
Um, we have looked through these state budgets and found that when states and counties say they're spending money on public health, most of the time it's like happening in Baltimore where they're taking their public health money and offering clinical services with it. And when we take out the clinical services, we find that about half of the, the public health budgets in America are actually taking care of prevention uh, for populations. And the numbers are not getting better. We spent the last uh, uh, 10 years in states, this is state governmental spending, the last slide was national spending, state public health spending has gone down in the last 10 years. Communicable disease control, which would have helped us get ready with testing and contact tracing, uh, has been uh, only 10% of this budget and it's been flat uh, over time and public health preparedness has been a, a tiny fraction of public health spending in the USA. I'll skip over this. So in the US, this isn't new what we're doing in, in the last 10 years. Over 100 years, communities around the world uh, had a syndrome of neglecting public health, having a public health crisis leading to panic remembering doing something about public health and within a few years repeating it. So this columnist, uh, Janine Interlandi, is hopeful, but not that hopeful, that after coronavirus vaccine, the panic will lead to a couple good years where we spend money on improving public health. But history says that 10 years from now, we'll go back to ignoring public health and uh, leaving ourselves vulnerable to another pandemic. <clears throat> is the US, <laughs> public health exceptional, and it's not. Uh, public health departments are neglected in almost all countries. And globally, there is there are no countries that spend more than 5% of their health spending uh, for their public health departments. And then when public health departments are funded in you know, South Asia, uh, Africa, East Asia, Latin America, <clears throat> the, the quality of practice is deficient and there are no units uh, devoted to improving public health practice. Uh, as most of you know, accreditation is something that we do as clinicians where we have to become board certified and maintain our certification. Hospitals have to become accredited. Uh, accreditation of public health departments is only available in the USA. There are no other countries that accredit their health departments, and we have only accredited 10% of our health departments. 90% of American health departments remain unaccredited. They don't go through quality improvement. Outside of the USA, WHO has only done national public health practice assessments in the European region, the Middle East region, the Eastern Mediterranean uh, region. It's only done that in, in EMRO for Morocco and Qatar. Uh, the Pan American Health Organization has only done public health accreditation uh, in 2000. It's been 20 years since the Western Hemisphere took stock of its public health practice. So that was section one, just to introduce you to the economics of the public health sector, how little we spend on it, how disorganized it's been, and what it needs to do better. I'm going to transition into uh, the next section, which is to talk about the economics of a COVID-19 vaccine. I did want to pause and just see if there are any uh, adjustments to something you need me to go over now before the Q&A section. No, I think you're good. Keep going. Okay. So <clears throat> on vaccine discovery, uh, first off is the way vaccines get approved. They go through phase one, phase two, phase three. I think most of us are familiar with this. We're in phase one. Uh, the, the scientists and drug companies would screen thousands of molecules for bioactivity, find some candidates that they think are effective, and then move them into phase two trials where you use human beings to check their safety, the dosing and the efficacy. And then the phase three trials show uh, that um, the, the drug is effective or at least as effective as a similar treatment. Um, if you can show that you are uh, non-inferior to an existing treatment and you are safe, um, FDA approval can happen. These uh, trials are expensive. It costs um, manufacturers, they say, $1 billion to, per, per new FDA approval to do this uh, vaccine discovery. Now, the vaccine development is changing dramatically in the last six months since COVID-19 arrived. The old paradigm for producing a new vaccine was that for there to be decades and decades of bench science on immunology uh, and microbiology. Uh, out of that 
background of public science, uh, private companies would start to do these FDA trials, and then private companies would build, go to the capital markets to get investors to help them build factories to, to uh, pump out the vaccines. After the vaccines go out of the private sector's factory, uh, mostly public purchasers would buy vaccines for their entire population. Vaccines are uh, very commonly paid for by, by governments and donors. And public sector facilities would take it on themselves to offer vaccine distribution. There would be networks of vaccinators to, to deliver the vaccines. Uh, there obviously are private sector vaccinations going on, pediatricians and internists all around America are vaccinating all the time. But generally, uh, there's still even in America, there's a lot of public money to, to buy the vaccines and to basically pull them out of the private sector. So the private sector builds the factory, knowing that the public sector is going to be paying them to pay them back for the factories that they built. The COVID-19 paradigm, same, in terms of the bench science all being publicly funded. But now what's happening is because of the, the immense public interest in securing a vaccine, the private sector is being publicly funded right now to push vaccine out. So they're not waiting to saying, look, the capital markets are gonna find investors to build factories to produce the vaccine. Uh, the public sector is going in as a joint investor to build the capacity to produce the vaccine. So that's great news that the governments are now putting money into the plant capacity. Uh, I want to say why that's so important. Um, you know, think to yourself, how many vaccines is the world going to need next year? And the answer is not a couple million. Uh, the answer is definitely in, in the billions. But there are very few factories that could produce uh, even 100 million doses of a vaccine is a lot for, for any vaccine manufacturer. They're used to only pumping out enough vaccine to vaccinate one year's worth of babies. And one year's worth of babies is nothing close to a billion. So now we need to have a, a factory that can pump out a billion doses. And so the good news is that the public sector is in on this. Now, uh, I know some of you are deeply following and have heard talks about um, the vaccine pipeline, and this is uh, already uh, ancient history. This is a one-month-old slide of the pipeline showing uh, the number of possible vaccine candidates that we have um, for consideration for COVID-19. Um, we have about 33 protein-based uh, candidates, uh, about 20 nucleic acid candidates, viral vector candidates, inactivated virus candidates. So there is a great pipeline out at uh, phase one of development. Um, but what's exciting is that uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, public uh, and academic partnerships here in North America. We're seeing about eight developers coming from public and academic. China, Europe, Australia, and other Asia are uh, heavily involved in uh, uh, the actual discovery in phase phase one and phase two of these molecules. That's really exciting. Um, and as I was saying earlier, the governments are in with uh, investing in plant capacity. Johnson & Johnson is getting a billion dollars from the US government so that when it, if and when it does have a candidate vaccine, um, there will not be a shortage. Uh, Sanofi is retrofitting. Uh, German company is is getting plant capacity. Bill Gates says he's in. He's going to uh, develop uh, plant capacity. We absolutely are right to not wait till the molecule is discovered and finishes its phase three trial to build the factory. Now the worry is for any investor that uh, the factory that you build in 2020 to build a vaccine for 2021. These are not swappable items. If this ends up to be uh, a nucleic acid vaccine uh, and you've built a factory to build a protein-based vaccine, that's a problem. You can't retrofit it. The whole thing um, might be useless if we pick wrong. So these investors are taking an immense risk in order to put down money for a vaccine that has not yet been approved or licensed. Uh, 
there's more uncertainty. I'm gonna take about three minutes to get through this slide. So each of these little units here is about the, 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 the difference between supply and demand over the next 10 years for a COVID-19 vaccine. And every single one of them, I've drawn a supply curve that goes from zero and ramps upwards to some level stable equilibrium. So this orange curve looks the same throughout these scenarios. We don't have a vaccine. We spend 2021 getting our production capacity up. Sometime we reach our maximum capacity in 2023 or so, and then we keep making that much vaccine for the rest of the decade. The problem for vaccine makers is they don't know what the demand curve would be like. Let's start up here. Supposing that the, the vaccine lasts a long time and we go into 2021 and social distancing worked and most of the world is susceptible and they need a vaccine. Well, then we will have a high demand. We'll have almost everybody in the world wanting the vaccine in 2021. Um, and demand will be very high. And uh, as time goes on and they get vaccine, demand will slip down to zero. So by 2030, nobody wants your vaccine anymore. Everybody on earth has gotten it. And all we have is the successive birth cohorts. We just give it to the new babies every year in 2030. And so you built this supply to supply the whole world and you only need, uh, you know, one twentieth of your supply every year, you're stuck with this big investment of factories that you don't need. Okay, so that's one scenario. That's a problem for the suppliers. They have this mismatch, too much supply, too little demand right now. And then at the start, too much demand, too little supply. If we start here and this vaccine doesn't last very long and you have to get a refresher dose every two to three years, financially, that's good news for the vaccine manufacturers. They will keep giving you booster shots every three years, they get to keep selling vaccines. Um, and at the time they, over time, they reach equilibrium. So everybody here in 2030 is getting their boosters. Everybody's getting a booster over a few years or not. So that's one scenario. If there are many people infected, what if social distancing doesn't work? We go to 2021 and nobody needs a vaccine. Everybody's got herd immunity. You produce this plant capacity and nobody buys your vaccine. That, that's the scenario we're trying to avoid. And finally, if there is a short duration of immunity uh, and many people are infected, the demand next year is small, uh, but we keep selling vaccine to those who are still susceptible again and again and again. So these are the uncertainties that make it uh, really hard to be a planner for the future vaccine. So much that we don't know about what the, the demand will be and so much we don't know about what the product will be like. And so maybe during discussion, we can have the class weigh in on their inside track on what will happen. So these are the types of decisions that people are making. These pharmaceutical companies have many, many important things to make for the world. They're working on an AIDS vaccine, a malaria vaccine, TB and dengue. They have incredible needs for the world and they're at a board meeting and the board is saying, should we take 100 scientists off of HIV and put them on COVID-19? Uh, do we uh, re retrofit our factories? Do we retrofit our regulatory, our lawyers? Do we do, we do that to produce this COVID-19 vaccine? And they don't know how much money they're gonna make if they get the COVID-19 vaccine. So lots of things that they don't know uh, and can't be determined quite yet. Uh, looking at the time, let me uh, move into my last section so we have time for, for questions and answers. Uh, I wanted to talk about economic vulnerability of how, number one, the COVID-19 virus is more likely to affect those who cannot social distance, is more likely to kill those who have health vulnerabilities, uh, and moreover, the social distancing measures themselves are much more dangerous to those who are marginalized uh, due to social uh, factors in the past. Um, so social lockdown policies that we've been living through have both costs and benefits. The obvious benefits are the lives saved from social lockdown. But the costs, obvious again, are lost economic output. Now, I know that we keep paying attention to the COVID-19 case count, and we talk about the lives saved from the case count. 
but I want you to, to think more seriously about the, the, the two-year horizon of this epidemic, especially if we don't get a vaccine. Uh, the models say that if we don't get a vaccine, we're just, we're not stopping the curve. There's no hope that we will uh, eliminate the vaccine through social distancing because no one believes that, that human beings can stay socially distant for 20 years, 10 years, or three years. So we're going to come back out of our houses and we're going to slowly infect each other over the next 24 months unless we get a vaccine. So COVID is coming for us. It's either sooner or later. So the lives saved might just be deaths delayed. The reason for the lockdowns, if there is never going to be a vaccine, is saving lives from overcrowded health system. So you don't die of having a heart attack that no one can treat. So the social distancing benefit is really not preventing a death so much as delaying a death uh, and maybe if we get a vaccine, preventing a death. But there is really, the, the calculation has to be how many lives are we saving from death due to overcrowded hospital or death due to shortage of uh, health workers. Uh, that doomsday scenario has been adequately prevented in most places uh, on earth, but that's the benefit. It's not saving lives from elimination of COVID-19 from the place. We're just slowing it down so that we can save, save those sick people. So back to the benefit cost calculation. Uh, we're, we're having an immense lost economic output for the benefit, not of never having death from COVID, but of delaying death from COVID so that uh, people don't die of overcrowded hospital. Um, and so the question in order to be a governor or president or prime minister that, that takes this gamble, uh, you want to know that uh, the benefit of saving lives is gonna be worth the cost. So the question is, what places will the lost economic output be so bad that the lost economic output kills more people than the saving, savings of people um, from COVID-19? Because poverty and lost livelihoods can kill people. They don't kill people in uh, high-income countries so much as in low-income countries. And let me go through that. This is a very uh, a common tool we use in economics called the Preston Curve, named after Professor Samuel Preston at the University of Pennsylvania. So what he's drawing is a curve relating life expectancy at birth to uh, gross domestic product per capita on a log scale. So here is uh, Sweden in, in, in red, and Sweden started 100 years ago with a very, very uh, poor country life expectancy of 30, and we're back in the, the year 1800 here. Poor country, low life expectancy. As Sweden's economy improves, its life expectancy improves on a long scale. Here, India in 1950, just as poor as Sweden was in 1800, as India's economy improves, its life expectancy improves. Uh, and then as it gets richer and richer, the, the the benefits of economic growth to, to health are, are diminished. The people's health is slightly related to their, their economic output, but the, the connection is not as, as tight. So this Preston curve says that um, losing money when you are poor kills you much more than losing money when you are rich. If India goes from its economic output of 2010 to 2000, its life expectancy goes down to maybe two years. However, uh, uh, if its economic output goes down uh, when it's poor, the, the health loss is much higher. So poorer countries are much more vulnerable to economic output losses uh, than rich countries, and people will die much more in poor countries than rich countries due to the economic dislocation of social distancing. So what we did uh, as our group is we estimated what these life losses would be. We went to the world and drew these curves for every country. And for every country, we said, let's take away 5% of your economic output, move you to the left on the, on the GDP scale, and say how many people would die uh, because of that economic loss, given your own country's Preston curve. So in Sweden, we would have done the Sweden would take away 5% of your money and how many lives did you lose? 
and they are the same. So we're using these curves to project how many people would die from a 5% recession. And we compare that to how many people COVID-19 social distancing control would save. So let me go through what this would produce for Namibia. In Namibia, Namibia is a poor country, and uh, we looked at the net loss of life in Namibia, and we projected in the orange, uh, just the children, by the way, uh, only children under five, we would project to have about 60,000 children's lives lost in Namibia due to moving down uh, the Preston curve. Uh, we use the Imperial College model uh, to say how many uh, people would be saved in Namibia because of COVID-19 control. And we found looks like about uh, 10,000 lives saved. So the, the net loss is in the orange and the net loss is 61,000 extra deaths. So there are more deaths from the economic recession than lives saved from COVID-19 control. The same happened in Senegal, Niger, Congo, Kenya, Tanzania, Cape Verde, Rwanda. So I wanna say something really important is that these orange and green curves were only coming true in about nine Sub-Saharan African countries. In most countries we looked at, certainly all of middle and high income countries, it was better to control coronavirus the lives saved from coronavirus control were more lives saved than lives lost from a 5% recession. But for these Sub-Saharan African countries, COVID-19 control looks like the wrong decision as the way to save lives. Think about it. In the Sub-Saharan African countries, they're very poor. Uh, their, their population is mostly children who are not as vulnerable to death from coronavirus and the children are those most likely to die from an economic downturn. So for these countries, we found that coronavirus control was the wrong decision, but for most countries, it's the right decision. So one of the things that I think you've gone over week after week in, this, in these seminars is global health has been dominated by everybody has to do this great thing, that everybody has to do like the, the, the rich countries do. So context really matters. Uh, men in global health think that everybody has to do the same bundle of building a health system uh, to do staff by board certified physicians and uh, offer separate pharmacists and health healthcare financing. Uh, we all think that you have to have whatever we do. We always want to have everybody do the same thing everywhere. Um, but I've just shown you results that say that the, the high and middle income country strategy of COVID-19 control kills more people than it saves in nine countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So doing the same thing everywhere doesn't make any sense. All right, so let me close up and open up for questions. What have we done? I've introduced you to some of the economics of public health departments. I've shown you that they're starving for money uh, in the USA and in every country on earth, the public health departments are badly funded. Furthermore, they're staffed by people who have not had good training or quality assurance in doing public health. Still, despite that, there's still solid evidence that when public health has its act together, it can save lives. Um, COVID-19 vaccine discovery and allocation, I've shown you the depth of, of ignorance about the value of this vaccine in the future. We absolutely don't know how many people will need it um, or how much money to charge for it or what it will be worth. But the good news is that governments are going in and investing in preparing to produce this COVID-19 vaccine. Finally, I discussed briefly how eroding livelihoods for people in poor countries dominated by children can kill more people than COVID-19 and that public health advice needs to be contextual. So I think we have time for some questions. David, thank you so much for this presentation and for walking us through all of these different pieces. So I think the, the first question that came up really links together each of your three sections quite nicely. So Pranab Chatterjee asked, uh, it's sort of a multifold question, countries that can't afford to invest in vaccine development, what is the likelihood that they would get access to them? So really here now talking about different vulnerable populations, access to, access to vaccine, um, and they're wondering, is equity and access likely limited by investment? 
assessment and do you think it might be fair to say that? Okay, so kind of that's a fabulous question. It is riveting the attention of, of, of so many of us and it's worth all of us thinking about it. Uh, right now, access to vaccines is uh, not limited by ability to pay thanks to institutions that we developed like uh, Gavi and the revolving fund of UNICEF. The countries uh, who need help purchasing vaccines are getting help from Gavi. We don't know what uh, this vaccine will cost, uh, but those funding institutions, Gavi and uh, UNICEF are being preparing for offering financial assistance to countries in purchasing it, as well as right now negotiating with the companies to get that price to be low. And the, the countries are losing their bargaining power because they're accepting public investments. So if you have accepted a billion dollars of US money to produce a vaccine, you don't get to say, I wanna charge $100 for it. You don't get to say that because you've accepted the public investment. So from an economics standpoint, we have measures in place to uh, solve financial access. What worries a lot of us is stupid politicians. We're already seeing countries say, we won't export vaccine until we have enough for us. And so Pranab's question is, what if you're on a vaccine importing country and all of the vaccine manufacturing countries have limited capacity, won't their politicians do political nonsense and say, no, we can't export vaccine until we've had enough. So countries that make vaccines, China, India, USA, European countries, their politicians uh, and this vaccine could be in shortage for several months. We might have several months with uh, way more demand than supply. And we'll face those politicians uh, saying our people come first and that that is a very likely scenario to have happen. I, I, you know, we're seeing how these politicians make their careers on uh, saying my people first. And I don't think, I don't have a rosy picture of how that's gonna happen in the future, but I'm not a pol political science, I'm an economist. And the good news from economics, we're preparing to get this vaccine priced right and have financial support to purchase it. So Pranam's follow-up question is, uh, would vaccine development be a distractor for resource-limited settings where focus might be shifted to funding healthcare infrastructure and primary health systems like what you discussed in the first section? Do you think this is an unfair or unethical trade-off to be thinking about investment in vaccine versus investment in infrastructure and systems? So, so for, for, for that question, Pranab, uh, given that there are some uh, what's called comparative advantages. If, if, if you have um, uh, scientists and labs and vaccine candidates, we should really allocate the resources to vaccine discovery there. This is not the month for a country with none of that to say, let's go and discover a vaccine. Um, my doomsday political scenario at that point would really require your diplomats to start getting the ambassadors to go to the vaccine producing countries and being friendly and nice so that the politicians don't do stupid things to them. But the odds of success with vaccine discovery are challenging to begin with and the countries that have that wherewithal need to do that. So let's separate the political uh, question into politics. But you know, starting from scratch in June of 2020 is not a, a high yield situation to find a vaccine. That's not gonna be the thing that gets, uh, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia a vaccine next year. Saudi Arabia has to um, do political stuff. At the, uh, you know, towards the end of your presentation, you, you mentioned it doesn't make sense to do the same thing everywhere. And so it looks like Clarence and Kyle have some, have some questions, some follow-up questions on that. Do you mean to say that developing countries should have focus on social distancing rather than lockdown because of what might happen uh, due to economic downturn and poverty? And Kyle says, uh, you know, could the low, could low income countries you mentioned avoid recession by simply not locking down? Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, the countries need to balance the benefits of coronavirus control against the economic uh, turmoil that it causes. And so the countries that I've shown you would have been better off simply letting coronavirus 
for their own sake, letting coronavirus uh, uh, go unchecked and try to keep their economies going. Uh, now, the caveats are that they would be uh, politically disrespected. People would say, what are you doing? Don't you, aren't you aware of things? Your, your government is, is wrong. And they would have to really defend their choice with, I'm really just trying to save my own people. But we, the larger point beyond coronavirus is the sense that we have because of our money and our power as Westerners that you all have to do it the way we do it. That problem has occurred for decades. It will continue to occur after coronavirus. A country should be able to assess its own situation and defend a choice of action that is not the way uh, Westerners do it. And in coronavirus, it is defensible to say, it is better for my people's survival to let this virus wash over us, create us uh, immunity in us, so that children don't die of economic displacement. That's not common, but at least nine countries should have been able to say that. And countries should be able to, to have the ability, and if we've done our job well as educators, they would make those choices. They would have the capacity to, to determine what's best for them using economic analysis uh, for themselves. But instead, uh, we just say, well, I, it's good for me, it's good for you. So I think some of the, um, the attendees uh, want to push you a little further to, to think about or, or maybe explain uh, why or how you make the determination of whether of which might be more beneficial for a population. So Aditya says, how do you determine which areas benefit and which don't? Uh, as you talk about ec how economic impact could kill more people than the actual disease. Um, and then the follow-up, is it possible for, in the U.S., that some states may benefit from social distancing lockdown and others may not, right? So thinking about New York for a state like Montana. Yeah, so uh, Aditya, that's, that's exactly right. The, um, the models that we have were not saying much about local economic impact in, the, in February and March. We're starting to get there. Um, for those of you who are listening, a um, website you should see for the USA is called Opportunity Insights, where we have uh, localized models of economic impact of the social distancing. Uh, in the USA, governors make the choice, and governors have made the choice, mostly based on politics, not based on how, how can I do the, the, the most for the health and well-being of the people. Uh, so we are, we are fit to, to have governors make that choice. We still have been slow in giving them the tools to weigh the health benefits of the economic uh, uh, economics. Now, it's, it's a very difficult place to make good decisions because the way governors make, have made decisions is not based on economic models, but based on politics. And they've been serving the economic interests that put them in power. So if you're a governor and the capitalists are funding your campaign and the capitalists say, look, I was never gonna die anyway, I'm social distancing, but I wanna run my meatpacking plant, that governor would be influenced to hurt people to make their capitalists happy. So the only antidote for that as scholars and academics are to give that governor and to put into the public domain models of what relaxing social distancing policies do to the health of all people. So the governors are not protecting their, their capitalist friends and protecting the moneyed interest for the sake of, of health. Now, most places in the USA are places where we're not gonna have a life expectancy damage from, from the economy. As I showed you with the Preston Curve, most, of, most high income countries will not have a life expectancy hit from anything other than coronavirus and the failed health system. Uh, people who have health conditions that aren't getting taken care of. That's what we're gonna see in our, in our health statistics in the USA. But to Ditch's question, you can find uh, many counties in the USA, rural counties that have had less than 10 cases and have every possibility of getting this virus under control with a South Korean strategy of tracking and testing and keeping this under wraps. That's a successful strategy in, in rural Montana. And rural Montana should know that and say, you know, we, we don't need to lock down based on our epidemiology. Uh, so bigger 
big answer is we need models of objective impacts to be an antidote to the powerful people saying, protect my property uh, and I don't care about whose life it costs. So, so as you talk about parameters, I think there have been some questions um, like, are there GDP cutoffs that make sense? Um, Andrews has a question. He says, Ghana has been focusing on saving the economy. Having realized the challenges of the three-week lockdown, mortality rates are low, but are there parameters that can be used to change the standpoint as the pandemic is evolving? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, uh, you know, you have my talk. The thing that Ghana could use is the slope of, of its Preston curve. It, in every country, the connection between economic recessions and lives saved is a little bit different. Um, and so we've been estimating that connection and, and the Ghanaian uh, decision makers need to ask exactly the question that they're asking. Uh, is the lockdown uh, hurting our health more uh, than we're saving from unclogging a health system? Let me go back to this point that most of the lives you save from lockdown are not because you you don't ever get coronavirus. You're just delaying the deaths. You're saving people from saving people from a crowded, uh, useless health system. Now, if you're in a country where the health system is not so amazing and where there are really not a lot of uh, life-saving treatments, where if you have an MI, you're probably not going to get. Uh, uh, TPA uh, uh, or, or uh, angioplasty. Uh, if you don't have an amazing health system, protecting it from overcrowding doesn't seem to be the highest priority. Who are you going to save? It wasn't an amazing health system anyway. So those places of unburdening our health system so that we, we still have it, it's not the top priority. Coronavirus is coming. It's going to sweep through the population if there's never a vaccine and we're all going to get it. So I, I'm, I'm glad that the, the participants are open to localized thinking and localized model making. Yeah, absolutely. I think people are really talking about the nuances of uh, different settings. I mean, right, you can't just blanket compare. It, it's not just, uh, you know, what we're seeing in, as from the U.S. perspective, because every, I mean, all, all of the data is showing we're not doing great, but also thinking about uh, how different contexts uh, need to respond differently. Monica asks, do you think the pandemic, well, based on your experience, do you think the pandemic will induce more public health spending in low and middle income countries? So, hi, Monica, I'm glad you're uh, attending. Uh, the, the example we have is the Ebola uh, pandemic. And there were dozens of white papers, white papers after Ebola saying, what did we do wrong? What can we learn about Ebola? And they all said wonderful things about we needed to build a better public health system and better trust. Uh, but if you go around West Africa, uh, you will not be impressed with the quality of how well that, that uh, those white papers were listened to. Uh, a lot of West African countries that were uh, beset by Ebola are just as, as, as beset by uh, uh, coronavirus. I want to tell you the good news stories about East Asia. In Taiwan and in South Korea, they went through the MERS epidemic and they wrote white papers and said, what should we do? And they built a better public health system and that is saving them. A lot of the story you're seeing about the East Asian countries was that we learned the lesson of how we needed a public health infrastructure that is able to, to control a pandemic. They actually built it, they funded it, they had good staffing and they used it in December, January, and February to really get way ahead of this pandemic. If we keep reminding all of the countries that, look, write your white papers this time about how you need better public health and better strategies, but this time do your white papers and fund public health. I think we've got a good five or six years of doing it right before we go back to the old ways of dominating our health systems with the old, you know, wait for people to get sick and pay the doctors and the hospitals. Okay, this might be a really challenging question to answer, maybe one you can't answer, but I'll bring it up anyway. Um, considering all of these different issues, how much time do you think it would come to get back to pre-COVID economic status, right? What do you think are the different factors? And, and I mean, I, I know it's hard to think about like pre, yeah. during, post, but what do you think? Yeah, so this is, uh, uh, 
many of my fellow economists are writing these models um, and they, they're wrestling with the unknown part of that, which is uh, consumer confidence and consumer demand. Uh, you know, at the beginning of March, uh, there was this myth that, oh, this will just be a couple of weeks. It's like a hurricane, right? We'll just get back our consumer confidence. We had a hurricane or a blizzard or an earthquake, we all go back. But uh, now that you've seen some reopening, uh, you're not seeing this immense rush of consumer confidence and consumer demand. People who've lost jobs are not back uh, to get their demand back. So short answer to the question is how long will it take to recover consumer confidence, consumer demand, not to mention employment. Uh, I think the time scale for that is in uh, the year, the multi-year time frame for that. Even if we get this coronavirus completely behind us, the vaccine comes, let's say June of next year, we cover everybody with it by December of next year, we're still looking into 2022 and 2023 to recover a sense of normalcy. Uh, but that scenario of getting us behind us, getting everybody vaccinated by the end of 2021, um, that's crazy. Uh, and I'm trying to be optimistic here, but I just don't see it. <laughs> so I think I, I've got a good question I want to uh, end on since we're almost at the at 1030. Um, links back to some of your previous comments. But could you go a little deeper regarding the siloed disease approach and arguments against that? You mentioned about white papers, recommendations that came after Ebola, but how do we actually change the attitudes and strategies at the funder level, which I think is such an important piece uh, in global health. I mean, we've already been talking about right, these different institutes like Gavi and the roles that they play. So how do we really change these different uh, approaches and, and yeah. encourage public health? Thank you. Um, the silos are real. Uh, I, you know, my department in population is all they can talk about is how COVID-19 affects access to sexual and reproductive health services. COVID-19 isn't going to make that go away. What I would like to see is once we start saying we need to build better public health systems and primary health care that we add to those white papers, okay, you vertical systems and silos, everybody in sexual reproductive health, malaria, dengue, fever, diarrhea, you've got your vertical silo, guess what? You need a stronger public health infrastructure too. The post-COVID-19 reconstruction of public health departments is the best thing you could ask for in HIV, AIDS, malaria, vaccines, diarrhea. You want this, you need this more than anything. So don't go back to saying, okay, let's, let's suck money out of public health for my vertical silo this might be the time for the white paper to say everybody with their pet disease wins if we go back to building these public health departments, give them strength and capability, because they're so easy to show that all, all vertical programs win with this. Uh, so that's my hope. And that, that impetus has to come from the, the host countries. They're the ones that need these public health units the most. They need to push back on the donors and say, donors, look, we, need, we needed public health systems for coronavirus. You help us build them and we'll all work together. It's not like either or, uh, but it has been either or. The vertical programs have not been funding public health systems. They've been working around them and that cannot go on any further. Great. Well, thank you so much, David, for joining us today. For those of you who submitted questions that didn't get answered, we will be posting the slides, the recording, and we'll try to develop a resource page to get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, Megan just posted a link in the chat. It's our, um, our usual eval form, so please complete the evaluation form. Let us know what you thought about today's session and any of the other sessions that you have joined. On Thursday of this week, we'll be talking about mental health and COVID-19 with Dr. Netta Gould. And again, uh, David, thank you so much for taking the time this morning to talk to people really from all over the world who are working on, um, on these and related issues uh, and talking to us today about economic impact. So thank you again for joining us. And um, I look forward to seeing everybody on Thursday, if you can make it. Thanks again.